Okay, so uh, next time, remember, we're going to be reading uh, the two uh, Virginia Woolf nonfiction pieces uh, in the anthology. So you're going to be reading the excerpt from A Room of One's Own, and you're going to be reading Professions for Women, and we will have our second presentation on Thursday, right? Um, also, your last response paper is going to be due this Friday, and then we're going to transition from doing the response papers every week to getting parts of the paper done, right? So the following week, your annotated bibliography is going to be due. Um, and then when we come back, the proposal, right? So um, I don't know how much work you guys have done before with Galileo or with other library resources, right? Um, but let me just uh, remind everybody, I think I mentioned this, but there are two databases in Galileo that are going to provide you with most of your valid sources here, right? So make sure that you are looking stuff up in JSTOR and that you are looking stuff up on the MLA International Bibliography. And if you do not know how to get to either of these, right, let me know and I'll help you. Um, you can also, I'll reiterate, make an appointment with the reference librarian, John Wilson. And he can also help you gather sources, right? One other thing that I'm going to recommend that you start doing for this paper, right? Um, well, first off, like it's, it's probably a good idea to at least try to think about the texts you want to work on pretty much now, right? And start gathering sources on them. And once you've got one or two sources, what can you then do with those sources to help you find more? Well, you can use those, right? How can you use a source you've already got to find more sources? What do you usually find at the end of a journal article or at the end of, a, of an academic book? What do I make you put at the end of all your papers? Oh, it works out. Exactly, yeah, there will be a bibliography, right? That will list the sources that your source used. So you can always go, like, work backwards from a source that you already have, right? Right, you can check their sources and use those to find more. Um, but yeah, remember, since the annotated bibliography is due next week, right, it's a good idea to get started on this now. And remember that if you have to order any books through the library, they're going to take a day or two to get here. So it's best to order them as early as possible and as soon as you know that you need them. I would also suggest that those of you who are working on the final presentation, right, if you have books that I recommended to you, right, that are on the sheet, it's probably a good idea to order those now to make sure that you have them in the time pass. So does anybody have any questions about the final assignment or about finishing up anything? So we are going to still do a final exam and that, the annotated bibliography? Oh, yeah, yeah. The annotated bibliography is part of the final paper, right? The idea there is, like, I want to make sure, like, because this is a research paper, that you're doing the research responsibly, that you're finding valid sources, and that if you're, like, sort of walking down the wrong path in terms of gathering sources, I can help you before it's too late. And you want the proposal by next week or the full paper? No, the annotated bibliography by next week. Okay. That's it's due next week. The proposal is due after Thanksgiving break. And then the paper isn't going to be due until the 11th of December. Okay. So you'll have plenty of time to write the paper, right, once you finish these other stages. But part of the point is that I want you guys to get started early because then that makes the paper less daunting, right? Less intimidating, right? And this is this is not the one where you pick a certain thing that we went over and go into more in depth like the other ones. This is not the one that you want by next week. That's not the one that makes sense. 
what I want next week is the annotated bibliography. Oh, that's the one you, with the... Yeah, if you, just, you, you, if it's, you, you give me the sources that you're going to use, right, in MLA style, and a brief paragraph explaining what each source is concerned with and how you're going to use it in the paper and what the author's credentials are, right? So I have put up a sample, I don't know if any of you, of you have seen it, I've put up a sample annotated bibliography in the, um, in the assignments folder on Georgia View um, for an article that I, like, the, the sources are for an article that I have coming out next year. Um, so you know what one looks like and you, you have a model to work with, right? Um, so yeah. Um, what you're doing for the final paper, is everybody clear on what you're doing for the final paper? Is that the final exam as No, there is an exam and a paper. Oh. Yeah. So. Yeah, one more time, just to make sure I make sure I know what you're talking about. Okay, so um, the final paper, right, what you're doing is selecting a work from the second half of the semester, so something from after the midterm exam and comparing it to a work from before the midterm exam. So you're, you're taking you know, two works that you think are in some way thematically similar, right? And you're making an argument backed up with research about the way the later work develops the theme from the earlier work, right? Like gothic theme and one of the little things that we went over to like, compare those two? Um, as long as what you're, yeah, I mean, you can take one of the gothic works or you know, one of the gothic ideas and compare it to something from this half of the semester, right? As long as the two things you're comparing are from, one from before midterm and one from after midterm, right? Because that's why I was going to ask you, uh, after you said something like that, I'm glad you said that. So for say I want to choose like the story of the dead, I could probably compare that story to one of the stories and the Gothic um, time period? Yeah, so long as you pick a specific text, right, to compare it to. Okay. And it has to be from before the midterm exam. So yeah, yeah what, 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 I, what I want you guys thinking about here is kind of like broad, the broad historical sweep of the course, right? And you know, how these particular themes develop over time. And you know, the cultural changes that are attended with that, what have you. Um, does anybody have any other questions about the final assignment? Now, I will also, um, next week, I will post sample questions for the final exam. Um, they will be like the sample questions that I posted for the midterm, right? So they will be general and thematic, rather than asking you to reference specific works. But remember that the essay questions on the final exam will ask you to reference specific works, right? So one thing you're going to want to do as you are looking over the sample questions right, is think about what, which works you could use potentially to answer these questions, right? And if you have a couple in the back of your mind that you can answer the, you know, answer the question with, then that'll better prepare you, right? Okay, so any other questions about final assignments or finishing stuff up since we are near the end of the term? Um, I think because there are so few of us left, it's reasonably, it, like, I feel like it's probably reasonable to do the final, it's, it's no more dangerous to take, to take the final in class than it is um, to uh, have you take it online. And I got there are a couple of reasons, like one, Overall, as a class, you guys didn't do so hot in the midterm, right? And I want to try to give you an opportunity to do better on the final. And there's a lot of research that suggests that people are better at recalling information in the place where they learned that information. So if we take the test in here, you will probably do better than you would do if you took it online at home. Right, you will probably have an easier time recalling the information. So yeah, we are going to do it here, and I will provide you with exam books. So as far as okay, so if you'll be in here, there won't be open notes, of course, right? No, 
but you also won't be expected to directly quote any of the texts. Okay. And I know, like, with the big time, I know, like, you, had, you gave us, like, the list of times and you wanted us to know, like, the author and stuff like that. Yep. Without the notes, I probably wouldn't know the author. But I remember the title, but not the author. Well, That's what you're going to do for. And this is why you study, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> sorry. I'm sorry for this play. I threw out my back this weekend. I'm in kind of a lot of pain. Um, and um, I'm on a lot of painkillers right now, so I'm not dealing very well with, uh, with frustration. Um, okay, so what you do is you take characters, concepts, anything that's related to the text we've been talking about, put them on flashcards, right? Put the, the potential term from your notes on one side of the card, put the author, the text and the definition on the other side of the card. And just work with those, right? Until you've got a pretty good sense of what's going on there, right? And the fact is that if you memorize it, you actually will have a, a much better chance of finishing the exam on time because you won't be looking stuff up, right? So yeah, I, I am actually like, I'm sorry, like I am gonna expect you guys to actually remember shit. You can't, like, you're not going to be able to spend your life just relying on being able to leave through the book. Okay, any other questions about the exam? You will have longer to do it as well, but you will have two hours for the exam um, rather than 75 minutes. It will be at our regular class time or no? Uh, probably not. I, w um, I think it is on the syllabus. Let me check that. I may have had to post the syllabus before they gave us the exam time. Because um, they, were, they were late doing it uh, this year. So let's see, final exam. Okay, so it's going to be on the 10th of December, so a Thursday, from 10.30 to 12.30 p.m. And you will come here for it. So let me just put that on the board for everybody so that everybody is aware of this, right? Okay, I'm just hoping that we should have an interview. Well, no, we should have an interview. Yeah, uh, generally the way... these are set up, they are set up so that you will not have to take two, you, know, you will not be scheduled for two exams at the same time. This is one of the reasons why it takes them a while to uh, sort out the exam schedule. They have to make sure that people who are enrolled in, like, <clears throat> they have it basically done by the day, the day that you meet in time slots, right? So you can't possibly be taking another class at this, at this time, right? So all classes that meet at this time take the exam at the same time, right? Okay, any other questions about the exam or the final paper? So then let's talk about T.S. Eliot. And I know I mentioned last time that I didn't really expect you guys to get this on the first go. Um, am I correct in that assumption? Did you guys find this pretty confusing? Okay, what, what specific aspects of it gave you trouble? Like, like what, what was hard about this? of particular terms and titles within the poem, but they don't actually necessarily tell you what's going on. So what we have are a selection of scenes that are built around a similar theme, right? Um, and many of the parts of the poem are being spoken by different voices as well. So it can be confusing 
to know what's going on or who's talking or what the point of any of this is, right? So on the one hand, right, if you didn't get this when you read it, don't worry too much about it. In part because um, if you had told T.S. Eliot you didn't understand it, he would have just you know, nodded and said, okay, good, you weren't supposed to. And part of this is because he's writing for a very specific audience. So Eliot, is what we call a high modernist. And high modernism as an artistic movement is defined in part by the fact that it is self-consciously difficult. Yeah, exactly, right? So he's writing for an audience of people who are like him, right? He's writing for an audience that is multilingual, right? So people who speak several languages, not the least Greek and Latin, but also various modern European languages, right? There are bits of French, in this, there are bits of Italian, there are bits of German, right? Yeah, that's what got confusing when you started like, talking in different languages. I was kind of confused. Yeah, and you know, usually the notes provide a translation, right? Yeah. But Eliot's original notes to the poem did not provide translations. The expectation was that someone reading the poem understood these languages. So he's writing for a multilingual, highly educated audience. And an audience that is highly educated in the European literary tradition. And this is fairly typical of high modernist work. They are aiming at a relatively narrow elite audience. Now, in terms of what they're trying to do, right, what the modernists are looking for is new ways of representing human consciousness. So, you know, the you know, romantic mode of going out in nature, being inspired by something, reflecting on it, and then spitting those reflections back out. Does anyone remember what we called that model? when we talked about Wordsworth and Coleridge, that inside-outside, that outside-inside-outside movement in a romantic poem. What do we, what, what, what do we refer to that as, if any recall? Didn't you, wasn't it something about nature, or no? Well, nature is a part of the process, right? But there's a specific name that this outside-inside process made into poetry has, or the critics give to it. already learned to illuminate what we're talking about now. 
that will also help lift. The more you're going back and going over notes to understand what we're doing now, will also help you with the exam, right? Um, so, <clears throat> he's not, so that's the way the romantics tried to deal with issues of human consciousness, right? With representing human consciousness. Um, the Victorians did so typically in a more kind of realist mode, right? Kind of like dealing with social issues and social problems. What the modernists are doing is looking out on a world that has been blasted by mechanized war, right? So think back to the World War I poems we looked at last time, right? And those kind of bleak depictions of no man's land and life in the trenches. So to a lot of artists, what the First World War demonstrated is that nothing made any fucking sense anymore, right? Everything was completely out of whack. Traditional values no longer sustained us. And what we needed to do was find new ways to represent the reality that surrounds us, right? So um, to give you some sense of how these ideas developed over time, even before the First World War, I'm going to put the names of four important thinkers on the board who are influences on modernism. And I want you to think about whether you recognize any of them, what they're known for, and then maybe what these guys all have in common. All right, so we've got Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, and Friedrich Nietzsche. Darwin and Freud are probably going to be the easy ones here. What do you guys know about Charles Darwin? He created the, um, the social, not the social theory, like, I guess, like, that stuff where it'd be, like, the strongest survive, stuff like that. Yeah, that's not actually, like, that's an application of Darwin's theory of social life that someone else came up with, a guy by the name of Herbert, Herbert Spencer. Did he, I thought he came up with that evolution stuff. I think that's the one. Yeah, Darwin, um, Darwin came up with the most plausible, like the modern theory of evolution, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the first theory of evolution, but it's the one that is best supported by the available evidence, right? So what does Darwin's theory of evolution state? Does anybody know? That isn't it, isn't it the, um, the strongest survive so they can reproduce more and that how it is? Um, strongest in a very broad sense, right? So essentially, um, what Darwin is arguing is that, first off, right, that all life forms evolve from ancestor species, right? Um, that, and that when a particular life form develops a mutation that gives it a survival advantage, right? it will pass that mutation on to its offspring, its descendants, and then they will have a survival advantage as well, right? So one example we might look at is say like brown bears and polar bears, right? They're actually the same basic bear, right? Grizzly bears and polar bears are identical in every way, but well, in every way but two, right? One is where they live, two, is their coloring. So the polar bear, because of its white coloring, is ideally suited for living in an Arctic ice cap environment, right? Because its prey has a harder time seeing. It has an easier time blending in with its surroundings, right? The same with the grizzly bear in you know, the forests of Canada, right? Now, neither would survive in the other's environment, but where they do, where, where both species developed, 
these mutations became advantages, right? So the basic idea here, right, you know, particularly when we're talking about human evolution, the idea that human beings evolved from ancestor species, right? What this did, and why Darwin's theory upset so many people and continues to upset a lot of people, is it kind of decenters humanity in terms of importance, right? Um, <clears throat> instead of being created and lovingly guided by the hand of a benevolent God, we have essentially been brought to our present form by impersonal and indifferent forces of nature, right? So this was what a lot of people, I think, find hard to take in Darwin's theory of evolution. And think on that part of it in particular as we think about these other um, um, these other important figures. So what about Freud? What's Freud known for? Um, he is known for the way people think and the way they act and why they do that. Um, I know he also came up with like the id, ego, the super ego. Yeah, he's the father of psychoanalysis, right? So he's really, he's, he, just as Darwin is probably the single most important figure in modern biology, Freud is the, is the sort of the originary figure for modern psychology, right? even though a lot of his work is not regarded as serious now by working psychologists, right? But yeah, um, Freudian psychoanalysis really takes off at the end of the 19th century. And yeah, you talked about this id superego, this id ego superego division. Um, do you remember how this works, Megan? Do you remember what these terms mean? Uh, slightly, it's been a while. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have a, a good sense of what these what these are? It doesn't have the dual factor personality that things you need as a human. It does, yeah. So the ego is kind of like the con like the conscious part of you, right? Mm -hmm. This is like the part of your mind that is aware of being you, um, and it's formed by this constant push and pull between these other two forces, the id and super ego, right? Yeah, go ahead. Kind of like uh, in the cartoons where you have the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. It is very much like that. Yeah, that actually that model is actually called psychomachy, by the way. And the id is the little devil on your shoulder, right? The id is the part of your brain that it, that you know it wants food. It wants sex, it wants recognition, it wants gratification, right? It wants what it wants, and it wants it right now without any hesitation, right? The superego is like a little angel on your shoulder, right? Now, the problem with this model is that neither of these is really good or evil, right? Both are necessary to some extent for human survival. Um, the superego is essentially the fear of social disapproval, right? Why do we not just let our kids run rampant? Well, because then people might punish us or not like us, right? So that weight of social disapproval or of potential social disapproval keeps the id in check, right? Now, as I said, in, a, in the Freudian system, both of these are actually necessary, right? If your id is too weak, then you're afraid to do anything, right? If your superego is too weak, then you just follow your impulses wherever they lead you, right? And a well, that a healthy personality holds the two in balance. But what's going on here, why this is important, right, is it demonstrates that most of our personality is formed, again, by these kind of impersonal primal forces that we're not even aware of. Right? We're not aware of the push, like the, it, the push and pull between it and superego is going on underneath our conscious minds, right? So we're formed, but so our actions are formed and dictated by these forces over which we have actually very little control. Now, what about Karl Marx? What, if anything, do you guys know about Karl Marx? OK, 
okay, psychology, that's a little strange. It's not really kind of where, he's really more an, an economist than a psychologist. Um, so Marx is, again, not the inventor of the idea of communism or the only person to ever proposed communist theories, but his ideas form the basis of most modern communist or socialist thought. Right, so Marx was concerned with the role of the worker in a capitalist society, right? That essentially, all the worker had to sell was his labor power, right? You're just, you're working all day for a guy who owns a machine. The guy who owns the machine takes most of the profits and pays you out of pickets, right? So you know, think about, for example, like the, the situation of those match girls that we talked about um, when we were you know, talking about the industrial world. Um, the, the girls who worked in the match factory were, you know, they're, the guys who owned the factory were making outrageous profits, right? And the girls who worked in the match factory were making very little and getting sick. So what Marx is talking about is the alienation of human beings from the fruits of their labor. Are we noticing a theme developing here yet? Can we see connections here? What are, what's, the, what, what's the primary, like, so Darwin is demonstrating that we are the product of natural forces over which we have no control, right? Freud is demonstrating that our personality is formed by this push and pull between these two forces we have no control over. Marx is arguing that we have little or no control over our working lives. Do we see what's going on here? So yeah, this notion that we're much less in control of the world in our lives than we really are, right? And that leads us to Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche argues that there is nothing in the world that has any inherent meaning, right? The institutions that sustain society, religion, social life, whatever, right? You know, like the only things that have meaning, like all things have meaning only because human beings assign meaning to them, right? And that when we recognize the, meaningless, uh, the meaninglessness of life, there are two possible responses, right? He illustrates this through a thought experiment uh, he calls the eternal occurrence. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is think for a minute, just imagine that you are falling down an endless chasm, right? You will never not be falling. You are never going to die and you are never going to hit bottom. You are going to be falling with nothing to stop you for the rest of eternity, right? On top of that, a little demon appears on your shoulder and keeps whispering in your ear, it never gets better. It never gets better. It never gets any better. So for Nietzsche, there are two basic responses to this dilemma, right? The inferior person will respond by freaking out and by trying to cling to some sort of belief that no, 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 there's something that's gonna stop me, something's gonna catch me, right? These institutions that I've always relied upon are gonna stop this fall in some way. Well, he regards the superior response, the superior person's response, as being simple acceptance that this is the state of things and that you have to be strong and comfortable in yourself and just 
accept the meaninglessness of the remainder of your existence, right? So what Eliot is writing about in the wasteland is a world that has been kind of robbed of objective meaning, of any kind of inherent meaning, and any kind of certainties, right? So a lot of what he's doing is trying to pull together various bits of texts from Europe, the European tradition into a kind of collage, right? So do you guys know what a collage is in art? What is a collage? Um, and what does the group of pictures in a collage collectively create? Oh, they're all similar to each other. Exactly, right? You take a bunch of smaller things, right? You, you cut a whole bunch of bits out of, say, uh, you know, pictures from magazines, right? And you glue them together to make a new picture, right? So that's basically what Eliot is doing in the wasteland. He is taking all of these bits of history, Right, literature, opera, and even pop culture. And he's making a collage that represents, for him, the state of modern European life after the First World War. In fact, if we look at the very end of the poem, we get this... Um, we get a kind of oblique demonstration of the method here, right? On page 673, right? London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Puesto cos no foco se blida fina, cuando fuamo ti chelidon, o swallow, swallow, le prince de Acotan, la tura boli. These fragments I have shorn against my ruins. Why, then I'll fight you. Hieronymo's mad again. Data, diadavum, damyata. Shanti, shanti, shanti. So this all looks like nonsense, right? But the key sentence in the stanza is these fragments I have shored against my ruins. Right? All of these lines are quotations from other sources. What language? Where? What you just say? What language did you just speak? Those times you just said, what language? There's, there's Italian, there's French, there's Sanskrit. So yeah, there are several different languages in this, in this stanza, right? Um, so <clears throat> what he's doing in this stanza is gathering fragments, right? He's gathering these fragments of literature and of philosophy and trying to build a kind of defensive wall around himself, right? That's, in a lot of ways, the whole purpose of the poem, right? Is to take these fragments of shattered European civilization and try to build them into some kind of new picture. And there are a lot of anxieties expressed in this poem about um, the future and about um, the potential state of European civilization. So let's look, at the, let's look at the title for a second and think about what that means and what that tells us about the concerns of the poem. What is a wasteland? Yeah, empty, torn up, right? Nothing grows, right? So a wasteland is essentially land that is infertile, right? Right, if we look near the beginning of the poem, on page 660, um, we get 
are first a description of uh, the wasteland itself, right? What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either, your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Now, when I was in high school and I first read this poem, I wrote that line, I will show you fear in a handful of dust, all over my notebooks. I had no idea what the hell it meant, but it sounded really metal. <laughs> but what does this mean? What, is, what, what does fear, what is fear in a handful of dust here? What does the handful of dust from a wasteland represent? I guess a new Yeah, uh, dust. Yeah, dust is dry and fertile soil, right? I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Right? I will show you the sterility of the world around you, right? This is a land in which nothing will grow. And much of the imagery in the poem is devoted to these ideas of infertility. In particular, um, there's a strong concern with sexual relationships. Right, which, you know, the wasteland is not just, you know, it's not just a land in which nothing will grow. It's a society that has basically exhausted itself, right? That has exhausted all of its resources um, and no longer has the potential to grow. Right? All you can do is pull together the fragments and try to make something new out of it. Um, so to give you an example of this, right? now not all of the sexual imagery here is particularly obvious. Um, again, if we start on page 660, there's the discussion of the Starnberger's Day. Now the reference to the Starnberger's Day is the first of several references to drowned bodies. And this is something that you probably won't get unless you read the footnote. The Starnberger Zee is it's, it's, a, it's a large lake in Central Europe. And <clears throat> the king of Bavaria Ludwig II, in the 19th century, was drowned in it under very suspicious circumstances. Now, here's why this matters for the poem and for the imagery in the poem. So Ludwig was a kind of harmless eccentric uh, who was known to history as Mad Ludwig, right? But not because he you know, actually like, he went around impaling people or anything like that. Um, because he had this obsession uh, with building castles, right? So he builds, he builds all of these beautiful fairy tale castles all over Bavaria. Um, how many of you have ever seen um, the, uh, what is the Sleeping Beauty's castle in Disney, at Disney World? At least pictures of it, right? Um, that castle is modeled on Ludwig's castle at Neuschwanstein in Bavaria. So the reason Ludwig was supposedly murdered, well, there are two reasons. One uh, is that his castle building obsession was bankrupting the Bavarian treasury. And secondly, Ludwig was more or less openly homosexual and was unlikely to produce an heir to the throne. So people who wanted him out of the way supposedly shoved him into the Starnberger Zee and he drowned. So the drowned body of Ludwig 
is related to other drowned bodies in the poem, right? We have in Death by Water, the shortest segment of the poem, page 669. The sailor, right, Phlebas the Phoenician. Right. Phlebas the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bones in whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, O oh you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. So keep Phlebas in your brain for a minute and turn to page 666, where it talks about Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant. So like Phlebas, a uh, Middle Easterner. Unshaven, with a pocket full of currants, right, the little, the little berries, the little fruit, like the, you know, meant to evoke the same current that swallows up Phlebas. CIF London, documents at sight, asked me in demotic French to lunch at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. So Mr. Eugenides is... Uh, doing something that would be recognizable to readers in Eliot's time as making a homosexual proposition to the speaker here, right? So Mr. Eugenides is connected to Phlebas the Sailor. They're more or less the same character. So he's also associated with this drowned body. Now, if we think about a drowned body, as opposed to a body that's buried, right? We have those references in the first part of the poem, you know, the burial of the, right, the burial of the dead, right? We have lilacs sprouting out of the dead land, questions about whether that corpse you planted last year has sprouted, right? What do we generally expect uh, to happen to a body that is buried normally? Uh, Dustin Soil, you said? Yeah, I mean, like, essentially, like, we, you know, it, it's maybe not very pleasant to think about, especially, you know, given everything that's going on, right? But essentially, we become fertilizer, right? A body breaks down, the compounds that made up you go into the soil and to breed new life, right? So why drowned body? What, 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 what's different about a, body, about a, a drowned body here? Yeah, it doesn't decompose the same way, right? You're not breeding lilacs out of the Dead Sea, right? So the drowned body is a body that does not contribute to the fertility of the land, right? So we're looking here at these kind of infertile deaths. And we'll talk about why this matters. Um, in a moment. But there's another related image that I want to talk about that starts after the discussion of Mr. Eugenides here. Um, we have the, you know, the typist and her encounter with the young man carbuncular, right? The young man with pimples. So starting on page 666 here, right? At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits like a taxi, throbbing, waiting, I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing through two, between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see at the violet hour, the evening hour that, stri that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea. So the figure here of Tiresias, so he uses this figure from Greek mythology to speak this portion of the poem. Does anybody know who Tiresias was? Wasn't he a Greek god? Tiresias was not a god, no. Oh no, he was something like, wasn't he in the underworld part? 
Okay, you're thinking of the maybe of the Odyssey. I guess. Okay, so so Odysseus. Odysseus um, Summons up the spirit of Tiresias to tell him how to get home. I, I thought he 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 part of the underworld, ain't he? No. Um. Well, I mean, eventually, everyone is. But Tiresias is a seer, right? He's a prophet. And what makes him significant for the poem here is not just that he's you know a kind of all-seeing prophet, but also that according to myth, he has lived. as both man and woman, right? He's wandering in the hills one day, and he sees two snakes mating with each other, and he separates them with a stick. And when he does so, he's changed into a woman. And he lives as a woman for several years, and then eventually comes across the same two snakes doing exactly the same thing, hits them with a stick again, and is changed back into a man. So Tiresias is important for the poem because he is able to see um, life and sexuality through two, those two different perspectives, right? He's lived as a man and as a woman. The typist home at tea time clears her breakfast, lights her stove, and lays out food in tins. Out of the par window, perilously spread her drying combinations touched by the sun's last rays, on the divan are piled, at night her bed, stockings, slippers, camisoles, and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I, too, awaited the expected guest. He, the young man carbuncular, arrives, a small house agent's clerk with one bold stare, one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious as he guesses. The meal is ended, she is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all and acted on the same divan or bed. I, who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead, bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way finding the stairs unlit, right? So what happens here between the typist and the young man carbuncular? What is this scene describing? Right, she's invited him to her apartment, right? She lays out dinner for him, you know, they, you know, they, she, you know, cooks a you know cooks a meal out of out of, out of the tins, right? So because it's kind of mass-produced dinner. And then after dinner, what, he, what does he try? What, or what, what, what does he do? Is it really that unclear? <laughs> Or are we just nervous about it? Um, I'm looking at the one the endeavors to engage her in caresses. Uh-huh. Yeah, he tries to get her turned on, right? And does, is she responsive? No, but does he stop? No, he assaults her. Yeah, she, yeah, she, she, yeah, she neither, <clears throat> she neither encourages nor stops him. He takes that as a sign, okay, it's, it's go time, right? And then um, just continues. So yeah, we would today regard this as assault, right? He gives her one final patronizing kiss and then leaves. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. So what's happened here is an essentially pointless sexual encounter from which no one got anything, right? So this plays into the broader theme of fear of infertility. That is sort of that 
Eliot plays with throughout the poem, right? And let me talk a little bit about what the basis for some of this is as well. Right? So there's a book published at the end of the 19th century by a Scottish anthropologist by the name of J.G. Fraser called The Golden Bough. And this book, like these other four thinkers here, did a lot to unsettle people's certainties, uh, particularly about religion um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So what Fraser was primarily interested in was comparing religious practices and ritual practices across the world. So it is a work of comparative religion. And one thing that he claims to notice is the prevalence across various cultures of what he, what he and others come to call life, death, rebirth duties. Right, that many cultures it seems to share this idea of a god who is um, in some way related to vegetation. Who's born in the spring and dies in the autumn and then comes back again in the spring. So he relates a number of mythological figures and religious figures uh, to this particular model, right? The Egyptian god Osiris, who was associated with the ebbing and flowing of the Nile, right? And is also the god of the dead. The Greek god Adonis. The Babylonian god Tammuz. The Norse god, Baldr, who's the god of light. And also, the Christ story. Now, what Fraser is arguing is that from a ritual perspective, the vegetation god has to die in the fall and come back in the spring, right? Otherwise, the whole cycle gets messed up and everything is ruined. So, you know, people will, you know, through ritual, reenact these, um, you know, this process to make sure it continues to go off, to make sure it continues to happen. Now, Eliot is adapting this mythological model not only to fit modern culture, but to build his poem around a story from the medieval Arthurian legend, right? So we've already looked at the way the story of King Arthur is adopted by different generations for different purposes, right? Um, you know, we talked about Tennyson, Tennyson's way of using King Arthur to promote, you know, sort of these ideas like Carlisle's, right? Now, the specific aspect of the Arthur legend <clears throat> that <clears throat> Eliot is focusing on is the, uh, the story of the Fisher King. Um, have any of you heard of the Fisher King before? Do any of you know who or what this is? I'm going to guess no, because I remember you claimed unfamiliarity with the King Arthur story that we talked about Tennyson a few weeks ago. Um, so the Fisher King is the keeper of the Holy Grail. And he is the king of the wasteland. Right, so all of these references to people fishing in the poem are references to this figure, the Fisher King. 
Now the Fisher King is described as having been wounded in the thigh. in most of the medieval romances in which he appears. Now, wounded in the thigh is a polite medieval euphemism for castrated. So as the king was castrated, the land is also infertile, right? Yeah, did you have a question? I was going to ask you, I think you just said the answer. I was going to ask you, was that more like a legend in that particular country? It was just more, that was more known about in their area, than, or that's just everywhere? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought that the King Arthur story was more widely known, um, I guess, than it is. Like, like I, I will admit, I was genuinely baffled um, when none of you had heard of it before. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, so, you know, I, I don't really know what to make of that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, is, um, you know, it is British and also French, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, well, I mean, you know, there have always, like every class I've ever had, there have been people who have been familiar with this, and I guess it was just, it was weird to me that no one was in this class, but that aside, right? Um, so <clears throat> what happens in the Fisher King story, right, is the Grail Knight, is expected, in order to win the Grail, to heal the Fisher King's wound and restore the wasteland. But he has to do so by asking the right questions. Right? He has to ask who the Grail serves. You know, and through doing that, he thus restores the Fisher King, wins the Grail, and brings life back to the wasteland. Now, what Elliot is doing is, is hitting on a different solution for bringing life back to the wasteland. Now, we did note a minute ago that one of the languages that <clears throat> Elliot uses in the poem is Sanskrit, right? So the classical literary language of India. So if we turn to page 672, near the end of what the thunder said, Ganja was sunken and the limp leaves waited for rain, while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavon. The jungle crouched, humped in silence. Then spoke the thunder, Da, Data, what have we given? My friend, blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. By this, and this only, we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries, or in memories draped by the beneficent spider, or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. Da, Diadam, I have heard the key. Turn in the door once, and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison. Thinking of the key, each confirms a prison. Only at nightfall, ethereal rumors revive for a moment a broken Coriolanus. Da, Damiata, the boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. I sat upon the shore, fishing with the arid plain behind me, shall I at last set my lands in order. And then the last words of the poem are all, the last six words of the poem are all Sanskrit as well. So these three Sanskrit words, data, Dayadavam and Damyata mean give love and control. 
And each of these in Sanskrit philosophy, in Indian philosophy, are instructions to specific um, groups of beings, right? So give is an instruction that is specific to humans who tend to be naturally greedy. Love is an instruction given to demons who are naturally cruel. And control is an instruction given to lesser gods who are naturally chaotic and unruly. So each group is being asked to defy its nature in some way in order to sustain and preserve the world, right? And the instructions themselves are important here, right? To give, to love, and to control. So remember that most of the actions we've seen described in the poem have been kind of obsessed with selfishness, right? Uh, think in particular um, the uh, the encounter between the typist and the young man, right? Um, but it's also important what the source of them here is, right? So remember, what is Eliot's basic notion of European civilization, the state that it's reached? Where does he think European civilization is after the First World War? What does he think it's... it's, it's Prospects are. Does he think his prospects are good or bad? Bad, right? Yeah, that it's basically worn out, exhausted, it's an infertile wasteland, right? So, one of the things that the modernists are doing is trying to draw inspiration from other traditions and other sources, right? So, in addition to all of this stuff he's surrounding himself and building a wall around himself with from the European tradition. He's also drawing on Hindu philosophy to try and reinvigorate this wasteland, right? The black clouds gathering over Himavan, right, to come and water the jungle, right? Any nourishment, any new refreshment is going to come not from European sources, but is going to come from somewhere else. So one of the things that marks modernist philosophy is a tend or modernist not modernist philosophy, modernist art, is a tendency to try to combine European traditions with art traditions from other sources. So like you see Picasso paintings where a lot of the faces, well, you can actually see one right here um, in the uh, insert, right? Where several of the faces look like African masks, right? Um, you find the influence of African and Indian music seeping into European classical music at this time. Um, there are a lot of modernist artists who are using other cultures, colonized cultures, as sources of inspiration to try to give European civilization a shot in the arm. Now this is based on a misconception about these other cultures, right? So in a lot of ways what Eliot and others are doing is kind of wrong-headed. Um, what they're, they're, they're thinking of these cultures as more primitive than theirs and thus still having more energy. Right, that, the, that Europe is simply too civilized and has thus exhausted itself. Um, and they're not recognizing that you know, these other cultures are actually quite civilized, um, but have developed along different lines. So, <clears throat> does anybody have any questions now about, about the content of the poem? or about what's going on in the poem, or the imagery of the poem, or what it's concerned with. Does this all make a little, even if the poem still seems a little bit weird and confusing, does it all make a little more sense to you now, like where all this is coming from and how it's put together? Oh. What's that? Yeah, and that's one of the things you really, one of the things you need to do when you're reading a poem like this 
is track words that repeat, right? Or similar words that repeat, like currents and currents, right? And track images that seem to be similar to each other. And you can get more out of it then um, than if you're sort of like sort of going through and looking, say, for a, a coherent plot. You typically won't find a coherent plot in a poem anyway. Okay, so that is really all I have for you guys for today. Um, I will let you go. Remember, last response paper is due this week, right? And then we're moving on to stuff for the final paper.